What kind of laws do you think that uh, they're relevant here? Education, Education okay. Children, when it comes to children and people who are all involved. Ministry of Women, of course. Yeah. Ministry of Women? Yes. Huh? Yes. Uh, Ministry of yes. Women, Family and Community Development. That is the latest name, right? And under that, Department of Social Welfare is the main agency, you know, for work, looking at the children issues. Okay, what are the other ministries? As you said, Education, maybe Minister of Education, Minister of Health, what else? That's all? Ministry of Youth. Huh? Ministry of Youth. Ministry of Youth. What else? Hmm? What do you mean by children? What kind of children that you're thinking? When we are talking about children, you're, you're thinking uh, of children who are in the school, who are in the, you know, a nice, with, uh, you know, caring parents, who children who have enough food. Is, this is the kind of children that you're thinking. Think a little bit beyond the box. Children who don't have parents, children who are left alone, children who are abandoned, children who are left uh, on the baby cradle, children who are refugees, children who can't even have uh, health access, children who are not in the schools, children who are with disabilities and neglected by their own parents. Can you also think of that sector? Remember, what is social policy? When we are talking about social policy, you are talking about, we are talking about basically, huh? Remember? Residual approach to welfare? Huh? Ah, after break, it's difficult, huh? <laughs> huh? Whenever we talk about social policy, who are main, you know, our, uh, our target, our main focus? Uh, mostly like taking care of the underprivileged. Underprivileged, the voiceless, the, 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 you know, oppressed. Because we know there are children who are well taken care of, they are in good hands, their parents are okay, they are uh, they're giving you know, all kind of care, cognitive, physical, emotional care. But when you are talking about social policy, we are talking about children who are not receiving all that benefits. That's why social policy is important, that's why we as social workers actually want to work, make social policy work for everyone. The, ch the, the child who is abundant and the child you know, who is in the school, not in the school for example. Okay, do you think we are on track now? When we, when we are talking about children and young people, of course we are talking about all... Uh, how many children in Malaysia? What is the percentage? Huh? What is the population in Malaysia? 28.9 or something like that. 29 million people, right? So what is the percentage of children? 4%? 5%? What is the percentage of disability? Look, social policy is all about statistics numbers. Huh? Huh? Disability is four, okay. And old people? Last time we discussed, statistics are important. These numbers, you know, are the ones you use to, to negotiate with the, you know, politicians. Look, we have 10% of the children, what are you doing? No, they don't have voting rights now, but tomorrow they'll be, you know, your, your, uh, huh? Huh? What is the percentage of uh, old people? Nine to ten. It's growing. It was seven. It was eight. Now I think it's nine point four or something like that. It's also when it comes to children. I'll show you some statistics. It's about ten percent. And how many of them are dyslexic? You know what is dyslexic? You know dyslexic? What? What is dyslexic? Reading and writing or learning disability. They can't read properly. You know, the, the letters look like dancing or an opposite, you know. But they are the brainy people. They, their, you know, emotional quotient or intelligent, you know, is much better compared to normal people sometimes. That's why sometimes they're very creative. Unfortunately, they can't read. That's why there is a stigma. You know how many people are there? I'm working on a project on that. That's why I'm asking you whether you know anything about that. Dyslexia. It's a very simple problem. But... Do you think any dyslexic child in university, there is any dyslexic child, uh, a child with a dyslexic history could make it to your university? Yeah, sure. Yes, sure. Are you sure? Yeah. Can you show me some? They have dyslexic, huh? Mild dyslexia. Mild dyslexia, yes, but, but mild severe dyslexia also can make it to uh, a university, but it's not the case. They have special schools, they have vocational schools, they end up there. There is about at least out of 10 million children in, 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 in uh, Malaysia, that is one third, 
1% of them are dyslexic. It's a common issue. In my child, your child, any, 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 any child could, maybe you must be having dyslexic issues that you are not aware of. And that's why they're dropped out and they're, they're not able to make into the university system, for example. It's 1%. That means 1 million children in Malaysia has dyslexic you know, issues. What are the services available for them? Any idea? 1 million is a lot. Huh? And there is one dyslexic association of Malaysia, have five centers and five teachers, and that's it. And some special schools, not more than that. Because government is not willing to recognize this is an issue. And that's why we are writing a proposal on, on this for the ministry saying that, look, there are one million children. And now, when we look at the services, whatever we have, it's not enough. For the whole of Penang and uh, Kedah, there's only one center here, which is by Dyslexic Malaysia Association. Just one center and one special school, that's it. For two states, just two centers. Can you imagine how poor our services are? So uh, why I'm bringing all this, when you're talking about social policy, it's all about numbers, it's all about quantification, it's all about scale, it's all about you know, quality services that we need to think of. So basically, I'll go into the, the slides now. Where is the... Just discussed about this 9.8 million. That is 34 percent, one third. It's actually decreasing. It, it, earlier it was much more than this. It's now decreasing. But 34 percent of our population are children. You can see the main ministry in charge of the children is Minister of Women and Family. We just discussed. There are other ministries like Minister of Education, Minister of Home Affairs. For example, children with refugees, children with uh, asylum seeking, children with uh, you know uh, illegal or you know children with uh, without documents. You know, these are the children comes under Minister of Home, Home Affairs, Minister of Youth and Sports that you have mentioned already, Minister of Health, Minister of Education, Minister of Media also maybe, you know, communications. What kind of, you know, advertisements should you should promote? Should we use children in advertisements or not? A lot of things, for example, children who are trafficked. You know, there are so many ministries, which is nice, but there's, the evidence shows that there are a lot of ministerial coordination gaps. You know, a lot of ministries talking about a lot of things at the end, you know, they are not able to provide the services to a particular child who is in need of those services, you know. There are some issues that we will talk about later. So this is the... How can I... How, you, how do I do... The, huh? Yeah, yeah, you told me last time, right? Num, number lock? So these are some of the programs that you will see. This is a slide again uh, taken from the, from the presentation uh, from that conference. Very interesting, which I could have never, you know, you know, collected all this if I would have done, you know, because she's speaking from her, uh, she's the director, what, some general or something like that. You, have you heard about Talia Nuru, the, the, the child line, 15999? Yeah. In Nepal, it is 101098. In India, something else. So now what they're trying to do is they want to merge these numbers to just one number so that, uh, you know, children will remember. For example, you're going to, you know, you are a, you are a Malaysian child, traffic to uh, Thailand. What number you will use? You wouldn't know. Maybe they have something else. So now they're trying to get one ASEAN number so that all children can, 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 can come up with this. We have children homes, you have uh, one-stop crisis centers, you have cottage system for children, you have Domestic Violence Act, parenting skills, child protection team, child activity centers, child interview centers, Noor Alert, you heard about that? The police is involved in this. The Noor Alert, have you heard about this? Yes? No? Yeah, yes. So many things are happening by different departments, you know. So, but, but what do you think? Are our children are protected? What we mean by, you know, child protection? What we mean by, you know, our children are protected? Protected. Child protection, what do we mean by that? When we're using this word child protection, what are we, you know, referring to? Protected by? By abuse, of course against abuse, abuse, neglect, what else? Is that a safe environment? Creating a safe environment that is a protective environment so that they feel better or they grow better. What else? What, what do you child protection? Which we will talk about that because our policies are talking about that. Or one of the goal of our policies is actually to protect children or create a protecting environment where they can grow. That is what you have seen 
Talyan Noor and Child Line. Maybe you can, uh, you can, you can, you can. Uh, this is the Noor Alert. Very interesting program. But there are issues with this. It seems National Urgent Response Alert on missing children who are below 12 years old. Approved by the government very recently. Very recent program. System implementation. There's a task force headed by the Royal Malaysian Police. The Minister of Women, Family and uh, Community Development as the deputy head. Then you have Royal Malaysian Police disseminates this alert about the missing children. Maybe you go and complain and they put their, all the details there. Alert to the relevant government and non-governmental agencies once it is safe and not categorized as an abduction case. It's missing, abandoned. There are issues here. Who is an abducted child? How do you, you know, differentiate? But this is a, it looks like a very interesting program. I don't know much details about this, but I think we should look into this. This is another slide which talks about cases that are abused and reported. It looks a very small number compared to Australia, for example. Australia, there's another slide I have not shown here. Uh, we'll listen to another presentation there. At least, I think, 50% uh, of the children has some you know, uh, referral cases, some complain or uh, uh, what they call, um, there's a high increase of, you know, uh, uh, reporting uh, uh, when it comes to not child abuse, any kind of, you know, issues. Even if you slap your child, they can call a police, you know. So, is it accepted? It's not accepted. Is it a cultural issue? We are not going to into that. But when it comes to uh, uh, Malaysian thing, you can see that. What do you think about this? These are the cases that officially reported, and you know, and, and people looked into this. Then there are, the, I mean, there is a system how it goes to you know step by step. For example, mother is the you know perpetrator or uh, source of abuse. You know, your own family members. In how many cases? 22.6 percent of the cases that are reported in 2009 is you know you can see the mother is there. You know, how do you find that? 34% 7, others, and a lot of things in others. Relatives, child minder. Uh, even I didn't know what is this child minder. Any idea what is child minder? Children's lover. Huh? I could not ask because, you know, I, she's very, you know, I, could, I didn't have time, but we can find out. Father, children's lover, I can see, you know. You are 15 years, 16 years, you fell in, you know. But child minder, I, I didn't uh, find what is exactly is this. Maybe it's a translation issue. You know, we can find on that. Uh. That's called second, secondary caregiver, yeah, you know. Possible. Or it's also, you know, maybe online, you know, um, issues. Yeah. Babysitters, caregivers. But uh, exactly, we don't. Relatives, for example, also could be caregivers or you know uncles and you know. Basically, this is the you know profile, and, and and the numbers are increasing. And according to them, it is a very less number. I think maybe uh, you know uh, one percent of the actual cases that are being reported. If that is the case, you can understand what is the you know uh, situation for our children look like. In India, there was one study by uh, uh, a group called uh, Tulip or Tulir. It is the schools, you know, where children are mo uh, mostly abused. We think school is the best place. After the house, home, it is the school where your children spend most of the time. Five hours, six hours, seven hours, eight hours. In the home, they spend about eight hours, ten hours, you know. In the outdoor, they spend about the rest of the time, right? But we think school are the safest. But in India, there was a study. You can also download that. I think it is Tulir, T-U-L-I-R, Tulir, an organization called Tulir. They have done a study in Delhi in many places and they found that it is the school is the most unsafe place for most of the children. It is the school they bullied by other seniors, abused by teachers and all kind of things. And drugs and you know, there are so many things there happening in the school. So what should we do? What kind of loss that we should have? Should we not send our children to schools? Home is also neither safe nor the schools. So where are they safe then? I'm not trying to present a very pessimistic picture. This is reality, which most of the time we don't realize, we don't recognize. Because there's a stigma when it comes to child abuse, for example. We don't let it, you know, know. Even children, you know, who are being abused by their own parents, they don't speak up. Even if they speak up, where, where to speak up, they don't know. Even if they speak up also, whether justice will be done, they're not very sure. 
So there, it's a very sensitive issue. So when you're saying that you're working with children, you're, you want to know about social policies or social welfare about children, it's a huge thing. It's a huge thing. You can really spend your career, I mean your lifetime on this because they're one third of our population. It's a huge scale-wise, scope-wise, it's a huge issue. So I, I request your attention to this. This is another slide by Dr. What is her name? She's from Australia again. She's a, she's a consultant to Malaysian government. Pauline, Pauline, Dr. Pauline. She, she's, it is a hard slide. She says that this is the main reason. Out of 100%, 20% of children are neglected by their own parents, by their own governments, by their own you know, policy makers or whatever, neglected. Whereas 80% of them are abused. General, Every, even it is true for US, Australia, any, any, any society, any society. Do you agree with this? What do you think? 80% huh? of our children are abused. Some kind of abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse. I'll show you other, you know, the kind of spectrum that she has shown to us. Our own children, you know, do you think you really care them, you love them? But maybe we are unknowingly, knowingly, we are actually, you know, neglecting them. Maybe career, pressure, you know, all kind of things, economy, you know. Uh, both work, parents are working. Unintentionally, yes. Uh, unintentionally, yes. And that is where I think the crux lies in. As social workers, social policy you know, students, we have to bring these issues. That means you have to be additionally you know, equipped. So this is one thing. When we say uh, abuse, it could be physical abuse, psychological abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, commercial abuse, exploitation, prostitution, trafficking, witnessing the family violence and not speaking up, also an abuse. You know your daughter is abused by uncle or father, or your own husband, your own partner, and you're not reporting that. It's also an abuse. In many cases, you know, it seems the mother is well aware, but she's not speaking up because the family prestige, her own, you know, divorce or whatever. The brother is aware, but he, he, he's not speaking up. It's also an abuse. That's why she says 80% is actually, you know, abuse and 20% only it's neglect. Neglect, yeah? Together, together, together. She also mentions the boys, you know, most of the time we don't talk about that. Even many boys were abused or comes into this. Maybe, you know, out of this 80%, maybe uh, say 50% uh, girls and 30% boys, we don't know, or maybe 50% boys and 30%. Basically, it's together, children under 18. Please. When we talk about child is 80%, child is 20%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or from the children who are a, uh, a factor, mm -hmm. 80% is actually neglected and 20% is... It is a general... Yes. You have a point, yeah. What is she talking about? Maybe we'll see the next slide. We'll see the next slide, okay. I think she, if I'm right, if I... Uh, it is a general situation. Out of 100% of children, 20% are abused. There's no doubt about that. I mean, you have any statistics, you look at our, our own numbers. Look at our numbers. This is for our 100%, uh, right? So it's growing. So to me, I'm, I can check and let you know, but this is general situation. That means, invariably, all children either fall under neglect or abuse. Some kind of thing, you know, unintentional, intentional, whatever. Basically, it's a little exaggeration maybe, but that is the severity of the, you know, uh, 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 cases that we are talking when it comes to children. We'll see a little bit more and we can come back to this. So what's happening in Malaysia? This is about Malaysia. They have uh, come up with an act called the Child Act 2001. Very important step it seems. Everyone is ta talked about this act in Malaysia. I think they're actually saying that this is one of the best things the government ever has done for children. The Children Act, the Child Act 2001. That means it's already 10 years, it's there. So my question is that if you have a Children Act or Child Act which, come, which covers many things, you can see that, which forms the part of the protective legal environment for children in the community because Malaysia also signed the uh, Convention on the, on the Rights of the Children 
it also has a, a, a comprehensive act. But if you see the, see the figures from 2009 and 2011, you have the act in place in 2001. And 2009, 2010, 2011, this is the situation. So what's happening to the act then? Is it not working? Or many people not even aware about this act? Or we are not able to use this act? What's, what's the problem? After 10 years of the, you know, uh, implementation of this act, what's happening? And if you look at the federal constitution, again, there are many other safeguard mechanisms for children. The federal constitution of Malaysia, basic human rights standards of the country, which also extended to the children. Whatever is for the, uh, for the adults, it's also, you know, extends or covers children also being covered in, uh, under that when it comes to human rights. Amongst others, these include the liberty of the person, Article Number 5. You have a federal constitution, right? Yeah. Under that, again, there's a lot of things that is there for children. That means, actually, it's good. You have a state and you have federal and you, 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 you have all this protective environment, prohibition of slavery and forced labor. What about this? What do you think? Are there any uh, forced labor even now? Forced labor in plantations or in hotels or in even houses. You bring, you know, a child from India. When I'm saying children, just, just, you know, widen your understanding. No, I'm not talking about just Malay children or Chinese children or, you know, Tamil children. You bring a child from India, her mother also, as a visitor, a domestic servant, and that child is abused in your own house. It's covered under that. It's there. Otherwise, you know, the, they would have not, you know. Yeah, maybe very less compared to other countries, but it is there. So, prohibition of slavery and forced labor, Article 6, rights in respect of education, compulsory universal education, Article 12, there's so much written about children, so many guarantees have been given under the constitution, under special, you know, legislation, but still, why, you know, why 20% of our children, you know, are abused? Is it something problem with the society? The very society, religion, culture, whatever you talk about. I'm not only talking about Malaysia. Everywhere, everywhere. In US, it seemed the worst. You see, doctor, every time when a problem happens, uh, the, the academician or whoever is in the power, they will come and come up with policies and, and protections. But often, it does not reach the target group. But why? Still violate, even for the disability, you know. Even, you know, you are a lecturer, you, you, you know that you, you are not supposed to park, but you still park, but there's no alternative. Yeah. So your point is, it's lack of alternatives. Lack of alternatives, hmm. you, don't, you don't counter at the, the source, the, the reason. Why the reason, oh, I agree with that. But maybe also a little attitude. If you want, you can find the alternative. Maybe, you know, there is a disability space. I cannot morally, ethically park my car, rather than I leave my car somewhere. But rather I will not park there. Your own thing. Maybe. You find alternatives. Yes, there is no alternatives. But can we also find alternatives or not? How many uh, common families knows that this kind of protection exists? The exactly. It's there. It's there. It's not, why, why is it not reaching? Maybe you and me are not working. We are not doing our job. Possible? Or what else? What is the reason, despite of all this, 20% of our children are abused and we are 21st century, you know, abused through online. I mean, what not? I can't explain now. Now maybe our children are more vulnerable with all these ICTs available, with all this economic progress, you know, that we made, with all these, you know, uh, 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 advantages that we have now. So why should we have this kind of development then, when children are abused in a, in a society and the numbers are increasing? What kind of society are we thinking now then? Why all this, you know, development? What for? For whom? And if you have an abusive history, it's likely that you will become an abuser when you become an adult. It's possible, it seems. There's a high correlation. 
Exactly, this is one point it came. So some uh, Siti Hava from uh, University of uh, Science Malaysia, Kalantan, she's a, for a medical college, she's a social worker working there, she, at least she used to be here. She talks, maybe the way we look at the family is very wrong now. Virtual families, single headed families, you know, gay families, you know, all kind of families we have now. Maybe it's some, instead of talking about child protection, we should talk about family protection. Once family is protected, the child is protected, the, the, the housewife is protected, the elder person, the grandfather is protected, everyone is protected. Why are we not talking about, you know, family protection? Our ministry is, you know, women, family and community development. Look at the confusing, you know, nature of this. Women, you know, also part of the family. The families are part of the community development or communities. So they would have simply said, Ministry of Community Development and then bring everyone there. But it's okay, they also said, okay, there is a focus on family. So you're right. This is one, 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 one issue that came. What kind of families do we have? Why is that our families are disintegrated, weak, or more vulnerable? And when she talks about child protection, or any protection, there are two key words. Can you say that? What are these two key words? Child and protection. But other key words, what, just protection. What do we mean by protection? Can you cut this protection into some two key words? What do we mean by protection? Are you protected? Safe, okay. What do we mean by safe? Secure. Huh? Secure, okay. She came up with two words, very inter interesting words. You're still talking about safe and secure, just one side of the story. What is the other side? Hmm? She says risk and resilience. Protection is nothing but you are under high risk. If you are under high risk, you are less protected. You are prone to risk. This room, for example, highly risk because there's no ventilation, there is no doors, there's no way that you can go, no signs, you know, exit signs. Look, there's nothing here. So we are under risk. Imagine this room is more, you know, uh, with, the, with the signs, with a lot of doors, a lot of ventilation, there's a fire extinguisher here, we would have been more safer. Our risk would have been less. That means you are more protected. Okay, without all this, also you can be resilient. You know resilience? Bouncing back. You know that the very uh, innate ability of each one of us. As a human beings, we are resilient. Your father, you know, passed away, you felt bad, you, you, you cried, there's a lot of stress a lot of post whatever stress but you come back to the normal life there is in our nature in children also we have this so it is the highly risk and highly resilient maybe a, ch a particular child is highly risk working in a factory but that child has a high resilience because his family values his care and protection is high so if he is highly resilient still he is okay he can manage he can come up he can you know uh, raise the voice but imagine you are under high risk and your resilience capacity is so less because you already came from a broken family. You don't know family values. You don't know the, uh, you, do, you are not literate. You, do, you don't know the way to report. You are under, you know, your resilience capacity is very low. What happens? I think we are talking about those children under high risk and a ro low resilience. Or even families. Our family is under high risk economic we don't have you know enough uh, enough uh, enough uh, income our incomes are limited you are earning 3000 ringgits looks like above poverty line but you are in kl putrajaya your income is limited it's not low it's limited you know you only have 3000 uh, ringgits which you go half of the money goes for the apartment and 3000 ringgits in uh, in uh, kerala may be better so uh, earning 3,000 and staying in Putrajaya, you are under risk compared to the Kada. So risk assessments, basically protection is all about risk and resilience. As social workers, I think these are two keywords which I have learned from this conference. I'll show you some slides. So when we are talking about child protection or child welfare policies, what kind of risk are we talking about? These policies which you are talking about, can they eliminate this risk and enhance the resilience? If yes, our children, the numbers will come down. The 20% the, the of abuse or whatever, they will definitely come down. No, your policy is not really working towards this. It's only a populism and some giving some 100 ringgits. 
the numbers will increase because you're not talking about the risk you're not talking about the resilience of your communities your families and your children so now tell me now look at the policies in a different perspective can they really talk about risk the children act now you look at the children act and see what kind of risk factors that it addresses or what kind of resiliency building mechanisms this policy has if these things are not there in a policy we can always talk about you know nice policies you know rights based this that but at the end no child is you know protected because these elements are missing you know, we can talk about university and all but the basic facilities are not there what education what knowledge creation that we are talking about so that's what i'm trying to bring your attention to look at the malaysian children act very interesting it talks about risk it talks about resilience but still the the number of uh, you know children with abusive history is growing so that means some attitudinal issues maybe family values or religion or spirituality or you know economic opportunities i don't know we have to do something for the families so or the or the uh, or the schools where children spend a lot of time so that our children are better they are in the better hands so malaysian child act talks about several initiatives all those initiatives i have seen shown you in the beginning tulir what is that nurul ah uh, all that activities because of this they were not there earlier they are now there because the act talks about that several initiatives have been introduced under the children act for what to safeguard children from violence abuse neglect and exploitation so look we are now little going little bit more more words violence neglect abuse exploitation what is the difference look same ha huh? look same right how do you differentiate this who which child is exploited which child is you know abused which child is you know under violence or what is the cause for what if it is a if there is a family violence it may lead to abuse or it may lead to an you know, exploitation maybe the child will end up in a trafficking there is a family violence the husband is beating the wife or whatever and family is broken they are separating and the children are abused in the process and at the end of the day you know they are also you know sold to the you know neglected and you know, exploited or you know these are all very very sensitive issues very interlinked issues it needs a lot of time for us to understand i'm sure these are the things that at least the the, the act is trying to you know uh, address which is nice for example incest i think yesterday also i was seeing uh, something on uh, on tv3 it talks about uh, an advertisement which talks about uh, incest and family uh, uh, violence in malaysia it's increasing all races across all races so uh, for example incest has been criminalized by the penal code act while the domestic violence act you have another act in 1994 protects the children against the violence within the family mm. if these acts are basically focusing on the violence but an act like children act or children act 2001 talks about all which is nice actually so that at least they are they are covered under one umbrella act it's not like you know okay you you go to penal code you go to that you go to this no now a child whether exploited abused neglected whatever comes under one act which is you know gives a, a, a better picture for the social workers this is what the children act again i'm just giving you more details there are 15 parts i think it's about 130 pages printed you know it's the printed it's available online you can see that there are 15 parts each part talking about violence abuse exploitation and all that you must look into this without this forget about working with children because i mean you don't know what's happening what's written in our constitution what's written about you know the the, the legal things that you that you should be knowing so malaysia enacted the children act 2001 which is called act number 611 for what to fulfill its obligations under the crc the act 611 repealed the juvenile courts act the earlier acts so basically what what happened here is they brought all these acts together to one comprehensive act which is very good it's the best interest of the children it repealed the juvenile courts act women's and girls protection act the children protection act all that they together and you have one act now so any child whether abused exploited whatever comes under this act now so we should know this act without fail 
there are many other laws right? even now you know relevant after even the children act is in place still there are a lot of uh, acts which are relevant you can see anti trafficking persons act 2007 births and deaths care centers child care centers children and persons act domestic violence act so there is a lot of uh, other legal provisions that that are available education act guardianship of infants act islamic family law law reform penal code registration of adoptions act i can go on like that these are some of the acts that i thought are relevant to the children it's also there on the unicef website these are the you know acts at least you know uh, talking about uh, children and their their well being so despite having all this as i said we still have lot of challenges and these are some of the challenges figures quantification you believe with these figures this is i think 2011 2012 statistics i've taken again from unicef website so you can i mean they're not putting them without any base they have references there for example 600000 children under 15 years are vulnerable to the multiple deprivation what is that multiple deprivation you are deprived of food you are deprived of care you are deprived of you know basic uh, health you are deprived of education facilities you are deprived of childhood recreation you know i'm not talking about logo land and theme park and all that basic you know uh, community you know uh, facilities for uh, children to play come together all you know across races there is some 600000 children under 15 vulnerable to the multiple deprivations of child poverty more than half million half million is what 5 lakhs 500000 hmm another 500000 children in sabah and well over 100000 in sarawak and kalantan were classified as poor even now you are from kalantan right who is from you have maria is from kalantan do you agree with this maybe why 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 do you think in kalantan is uh, 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 when it comes to kalantan why children are still poor child poverty huh no no idea why what is child poverty your parents might be very rich but your ch children are in poor because you don't have time to feed them you don't have a, you know uh, all junk food you don't feed them you know nutritious food you don't take care of their emotional you know so all that deprivations come together can classify as poor so uh, so child poverty is a very comprehensive uh, 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 concept again not just economically poor but there are poor in otherwise also social other aspects some 125000 malaysian children are still out of school are you sure at least the at least some reports i have read primary education is taken care of 100% but still it's it, sh it's, it shows that yeah 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 maybe then yes you know see being a you know one country we still have you know regional uh, variations and do not have access to primary education this figure does not include refugee children it's malaysian children we are talking about not refugees and others you know including here undocumented and stateless children only 66% of marginalized children between 7 and 19 years in remote areas so like sabah and sarawak attend school in 2007 only 66 other 33% are out of the school so i can go on like this this is the evidence that we can we can we can find even 2012 having all these laws and legislations so what is the point here again i'm coming to that where is the problem our policies are good our our legislation is good it talks about all kinds of you know rights all kind of violence abuse you know exploitation but still we have these numbers so maybe social workers are not working huh the implementation why always you know the whole conference 3 days what they were only talking about this what is the problem with monitoring and implementation i'll also talk about that are you are you sure it is implementation if yes why 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 people are not able to implement what is the big thing about implementation what do we mean by implementation they are not reaching the grassroots who 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 are this they 
I don't understand when people say it's an implementation problem. What, what is the problem with the implementation? Who implements? Why are they not implementing? Must be something else. Must be something else, I'm sure. Mm. It, it seems child protection workers in Australia and New Zealand, they bunt out in two years. They bunt out. Yeah, bunt out in two years. There's a lot of, you know, uh, uh, resignations or retention is a huge issue. Because you're a child protection officer, you work late nights sometimes, you work mornings, you, there is a shift. And there is a, for example, children under your care and their, their parents are separated and you are responsible for these 25 children, 30 children, whatever. And these children always ask, weekends, okay, I want to go to father. And it's you who will make the decision whether this particular child should go to father or not. And you know his father is an abusive history. At the same time, you also know children has a right to the parents, you know. God knows, maybe this week, you know, the, the, the husband or the, or the father will be very nice to the children and they will cope up. You are making a judgment there. So you send the children, that's what Pauline says. You send the children the weekend to the father and you are stressed here. What's happening to the, you know, I have sent them. Is the father is abusing them. You know, you don't get, you know, sleep. We have not reached that level in Malaysia. Neither India nor, nor in many other countries. And Australia, New Zealand, US, UK, they have reached that stage, that complex system. And a lot of social workers involved in child protection. Child protection is a big issue. The numbers are growing. There's a huge, you know, structures. I can also show you if you guys are interested. I have those slides. A huge structure. The moment there is a call from a child, it starts. It starts. There is a, uh, agreements between police and social workers. There's agreements between all kind of stakeholders. Very complex. And that's what, you know, people bunt out there. By the time the children comes back, you are worried. But after, after some time, you learn in the process, it seems. And you are making those risk judgments. How, what is the risk? Where is the, you know, there is a, you know, sheets for that. So what is the level of risk for this particular child? Should I allow? Should I not allow? How do I integrate? Whether, the, whether I'm complying with the laws or not. So it's, it's basically, you know, implementation is not easy in countries like that, where complex legal systems are in place. But what about us? I don't think we have those, those kind of uh, complex systems here. We have still, you know, I think child protection officers, JKM officers, she's not here. Which they're also talking about that, yeah, it's difficult for us to remove a child from a family. It's still possible in Malaysia by the law. It gives a child protection officer to remove a child and put them in, in uh, uh, crisis centers. It's possible. It's happening even in, in Malaysia. Maybe we are not aware. That's why I want to look at the system more closely. But it's very interesting. We are talking about one third of our population. How many? 10 million children. Out of 10 million, 20% are under abuse. That means how much? Almost 200,000 children. Looking at 200,000 children, how many social workers needed? How, 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 with how many children you can work actually? 50, 60, 100? Not more than that. It's the like case loads, you know? So if you can work with 100 children, how many social works we do we need? Two. No, no, at least numbers. We don't have that. And we don't have. So this is a, a theme that came up and governments will be more serious maybe now. They will uh, pass the Social Work Act now and there will be more social workers, I'm not sure. So, I will, I will uh, highlight some more challenges. We'll take a break now, of course. Uh, uh, some more challenges. There are these street children, stateless children, refugee children, there are a lot of numbers, you know, uh, labors, and, and we can't even think of them. If a Malaysian child, under the law, 20% of them are abused or, you know, 80% uh, neglected. What can we think of these children? They're much more vulnerable. They're double at disadvantage. Neither they are the Malaysian, they're neither they have, uh, you know, rights, they're stateless, they're refugees, their status is very different. Their life is much more vulnerable. So what kind of social policies or social services that, that we can think of when it comes to these children? Again, for example, uh, this is for the especially you know, another issue because Vasumati is also working on this. There are a lot of things happening. Even right to breastfeeding is a big issue. She can talk about that maybe. And then, yeah, one day, you know, maybe you, know, you can have a presentation on that. This is a social, social issue. And uh, companies like this are providing, it seems, and this is one of the best 
best you know, uh, practices or whatever. This is what's been shown in the conference. That's why I included this slide. Maybe you can talk about more. It is an issue. That's what I'm saying, children poverty. The, you are well off, your mother is educated, everything is there, but the very attitude of the mother, which is the media influenced. Once you breastfeed your children, maybe your shape will, you know, whatever. And then you, you, you believe that Nestle is better or, you know, some, some other food is better. That's a, that's a violation. That's a violation. That's an abuse. And nobody knows that. Uh, knows that. There's a code to protect them. Maybe it's like this. Cigarette smoking is injurious to health. You still smoke. Yeah. You know that you are not giving, you know, after all you are a human being. You know somewhere here, but still your other factors are, you know, impeding on you and not, not allowing you to think and act. So maybe these are the issues that we need to look into, the attitudinal issues. Again, for social workers, a big issue. Look at this. There are, you know, refugee children, SLM seeking children, many children are under, you know, nutri I mean, uh, uh, yeah, no, no food. Here you have children with over, you know, uh, nutritional facts or whatever. Why, how, how can we address this? How can we address? Simple. These, the things that I'm showing is very simple issues, but there are issues. And it comes under that neglect or whatever. Formula, I mean, I'm saying media is a, plays a big role. It also can protect children. It can also make children vulnerable. So we have to question this. What kind of media that we are, you know, uh, we should allow? What kind of advertisements? What kind of, you know? So unfortunately, in that meeting, there's no media people there. This is a fact phenomenon. And it's increasing across all races. In our country, can be attributed to a combination of poor eating. These are all rich, you know, families. You know, people can afford poor eating habits. A diet high in calories, which is not required, McDonald's and KFC and all that. Oh. Yesterday there was interesting thing. Huh? Yesterday there was this McDonald's free coupon, the breakfast, you know, and you can see the line there. You know, I think some 150 people, all Chinese. I mean, including me. I also, you know, have that you know, coupon, and it was a line there. You know, everyone is carrying five coupons, six coupons. So you go to the counter after maybe half an hour, 45 minutes, waiting in the line. There, there is a says that per person only one coupon. Okay. And people were like, you know, uh, I mean, yeah, it's good that otherwise, you know, maybe people sitting, uh, waiting at the back, they would not get their one, you know, because there are people with five, six, seven, you know, whole family, you know, and only the mother came. So. Why is that? Why is that, you know, McDonald's is promoting free coupons? What is the, what is the logic behind? It's getting hook of it. Sorry? They're getting the hook of it. Hook of it. Is it they're trying to finish the, you know, the world stock? Or what is that? Or you even, let's say, 100 people get the free breakfast, the five ringgits, whatever, and maybe like it, and then they go again. What is that? Or children who taste that may ask only for that next time. There must be some background or some rationale behind that free coupon and a big line. Yeah. Possible, possible. So there's a lot of these, you know, business consumerism. So we can connect all this to, you know, when 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 we talk about uh, an issue like child protection. So child protection is not just your Children Act 2001. It's very complex. You can connect media, food habits your school, your, uh, your uh, maybe some religion, you know, they were also talking about female genital mutilations, which is culturally accepted, but is that in the best interest of the children? Can we ask these questions here? I'm not sure, for example. So this is, this is, this is the complexity that we are working. So we can make a, take a small break. Here I'll introduce some more theory now. Why child production is a still an issue in 21st century? Uh, a country like Malaysia, where most people are law abiding. It's not a Rwanda or, you know, uh, where there's a lot of uh, uh, lawlessness. It is a country where law plays an important role. We have laws in place, but the numbers are increasing. There must be some disconnect somewhere. Where is that disconnect? And how can we social workers, social policy students can fill that gap? Can you have some bright ideas now? Where do you think is the issue? Is it implementation? Is it media? Or is it the very formulation of our policies and laws? Or is it um, globalization? Or I don't know. What is that? Awareness. Awareness. 
What awareness? We are talking about 15 years, 50 years we have been awareing people, you know. We are a free country now. Awareness? I don't, I'm not sure. If you write a proposal on awareness, maybe you will not get funded now. Yeah. Those days are gone. Huh? <laughs> maybe Vasumati only can get, you know, funding for, you know, breastfeeding awareness. Still is an issue. But awareness in general, you're not getting it. <laughs> But awareness, do you think it's an issue now? People are aware. You have a lot of access to the media, newspapers. People are literate. They're talking about 21st century. Remember, there must be something else. People are aware, I believe. I know where I'm putting my child. What kind of education she's getting. Is it worth or not? Is it enough for or not? I'm aware, though I'm not, you know, uh, a kind of masters or whatever. Families, mothers, fathers, they're aware. But maybe they don't have options or whatever options they have are very limited, like limited income. You have 3,000 ringgits, you are above the poverty line. Unfortunately, you have to live in Putrajaya. What? No, you, you can't, you know, manage. Is that the reason? I'm not sure. So how do we, how do we understand that? This is what we must think about children, even 21st century, Malaysia, Australia, New Zealand, doesn't matter. How do we think? The way we think maybe it's not just care. Maybe we are very, you know, uh, 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 good in that, but also safety. What kind of school? International school doesn't mean that it's safe. It's good. Maybe that is where the most of uh, abuse takes place. Bullying takes place because it's very diverse, very, you know, uh, a different setup. Other, uh, other implications. Safety, protection, and then who require adults? Basically, then she talks about morally committed adults. What does that mean? Morally committed adults. In a child's formative years, like, like 6 to 10 years or whatever, till 10 years, if you have one adult who is a role model, that child is protected. That child, you know, much more resilient. What we mean by morally committed adults? Are our parents are morally committed adults or not? If you don't have one person in your family morally committed, the child will be under risk. That's what her, her, her thing. I'll explain more about that. You want to take a small break? Uh, South Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, uh, Student Social Work Conference. Why not? Why, why, do, why, why, do you, why is that you don't think all this? For example, you don't want to go there, fine. You want to Nepal, India, or you know, Singapore, or you know. Then you plan for a workshop, it's possible. They, those students will come here. It's like, not like, you know, this conference. It's a conference for students, for social work students, by social work students. Wow. Why not? But again, the problem is, how they going to get the money to come here? It's their problem, don't worry. <laughs> don't worry, they will find. Indian students, they work hard. I know them. I was part of that, right? They travel, they travel in second class. They do all that. If they want to come here, they come here. They'll find their own ways. But when they come here, you, 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 uh, you, you take care of them. For example, you're not asking them to stay in hotels. You're asking them to stay with you, to with you, to with you, to with you. So each student will take care of each student. That's what my students have done in, back in Nepal. When students from outside, they come, I don't have hotels and all that. It's the students who will take care of the students. When you go to India, that student will take care of you. It's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. So this could be your class project when you finish your, when you graduate from here. It's possible. Social policy all about is that. To me, social policy is all about contacts, negotiations, convincing, solidarity, networking. You can. Maybe, you know, uh, child production issues in uh, South Asia and Southeast Asia. You do this, UNICEF will give you money. You will give you money. I can get an appointment with the with the resident representative of UNICEF, Vector. He's, in a, he's in a, from India. The thing is, you guys have to have an idea. Idea, you know, matters. Anyway, come back. It's possible. If you are talking about child production in South Asia and Southeast Asia, people are willing to come and you will be get funded. The only thing is, you should have an idea. What you are going to do, how we are going to do. Okay, now, why we must think about children? Is it because they are future citizens? Is it because they are current citizens? Is it because they are, uh, they are dependent on adults? Or is it because they are the source or they are the future of the country? Why? Why do we need to think about children? They grow. They'll manage. They'll find ways. They cannot think. Okay? Are you sure? 
my daughter will ask you know you know different questions which i can't understand very critical questions which i never thought that children could ask for example uh, i'll think about and let you know that i mean i'm osmati can also can uh, can give you some children they're smart children they're smart they 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 ask all critical questions so i don't agree with that they can't think but why why we must think about children and child protection if what happens if you don't think if you don't worry about child protection what for example they still will live they still will make jobs they still make their own families i'm sure they will not stop okay the problem becomes multiple if they are being abused they may become abused so that the cycle continues the society will not progress the social capital is not formed you don't get the you know the best talent out of them they will not become scientists they will just another ordinary citizen who just go to work come back you know have a normal life no progress okay what else what else happens why should we invest in children why countries are investing in children Hmm? and what is this morally committed adults as an adults what we mean by morally committed are we really morally committed or not for our own children so these are the questions that we will explore in the few slides so according to her the again i refer to dr uh, uh, pauline she talks about there are three things that we really need to think of children are our most precious resource look at the resource you know as a resource point of view they are the resource you are investing on them maybe they are the kind of social insurance for you when you become old that is there right you you invest on them thinking that they will take care of you when you are old or when you need their help that's one thing the countries will invest them because they are the future they are the you know policy makers they are the future politicians they are the future scientists who will run the country children are the most precious resource so we need to think about that we need to think about them and how do we think about them there are three domains the care the safety and the protection they're different you must be really caring them but they're not protected you know you you put them in uh, you're taking care of them in your own house but when they go to the society when they're out of your house maybe they're more vulnerable can we think of a situation what do you think children are abducted when they're out of the house when they're in the malls for i imagine your child you're living in apartments your child is like 6 years she can't even you know press the buttons in the lift and she's stuck there what happens and she is not having mobile she is not having anything she don't know what to do she is not aware and children are dead in in those lifts i think yesterday was also in the news there is one child who dead in the park i think she drowned or something like that and parents look didn't look at them and uh, they they removed the body of the child from the park uh, you know thing children are vulnerable when, even when they are in the parks so are we taking care of them taking them to the park and you are busy on your ipad and we don't know what they're doing so care safety protection i think there are three important things that we need to think what kind of care that we are thinking of or we are providing them what kind of safety measures that we have or what kind of safety practices that we are putting in place and what kind of protection that we are uh, talking or what kind of protection mechanisms that should be in place both in the whole house and out of the house outside the house so she talks about uh, pauline there should be three levels that we should talk about tertiary services secondary services and primary services or secondary support primary support and tertiary support what we mean by that for example we'll start from the tertiary first according to her or in general when we talk about child protection we provide frontline services that is called tertiary services you know primary secondary and tertiary first second and third you know tertiary this is tertiary education university is a tertiary education a higher education primary education secondary education and tertiary education when it comes to tertiary education the higher so in child protection services when you say tertiary education it is actually direct services responsive the needs of a child being harmed or at risk or harm already child is being abused he comes to the hospital and you provide services that's called tertiary services and the child is you know uh, already stressed 
uh, he needs counseling she he's been referred to your counseling center you are providing direct services that's tertiary services which many of our countries are in place in malaysia also we talk about a lot about tertiary services how many hospitals how many schools how many uh, you know counseling centers how many crisis centers how many you know all that shows that i showed those are all tertiary services which we are talking about responsiveness the child is already abused and you are giving a response to that you are not stopping the child in the first place not to be abused prevention so why are we not talking about prevention prevention is better than cure we know that and each 1 rupee that you spend on prevention will actually help you know a lot of money later but why is that most of our services are focused on tertiary services that is direct response why do you think whereas your primary services look at that primary services as the services targeted at the whole society the whole community more of a preventive nature we don't do a lot there your secondary services for example reduce the risk factors we don't do much again i'll give you example for example uh, uh, say um, all school uh, uh, teacher uh, teachers are trained in abuse or trained in uh, child rights or trained in uh, you know legal mechanisms that, that are for children you know they are very well uh, aware about all these things you know or all police are trained you know how to deal with juvenile you know children for example you know for example so these are the secondary services you can still prevent them for identified at risk or groups of children who are under risk for example children who are from uh, broken families children from refugee families children they're still under risk but they're they're not abused or they're not neglected at but they're very highly risk prone like you are using a needle you are under risk for an hiv if you can stop here your harm reduction you may protect it be from from having contaminated from hiv you're still you know but you only do, you don't do anything now once you get the hiv then only you do counseling then and all that that is tertiary services why is that we are not doing a lot at primary services which is at the society making the society child friendly making the society aware of child issues making the society more you know a proactive when it comes to children are we doing anything on that secondary services you know still a prevention but identifying these risk groups okay children under you know economically you know poor children broken families children where parents are having some drug history children who are out of the school identify all these groups and provide them secondary services so that they will be at least will not end up in the tertiary when they come to tertiary services means direct you know the cure they are already in the hospital they are already in the you know counseling center they are already in the juvenile detention center so many countries according to her are actually focusing on tertiary services which are visible the government can claim look we have funded you know 100 crisis centers we have funded you know 50 schools we have funded you know this they can show the statistics they can they can claim their success because these are the places where the direct services are taking place which is good but actually you can do a lot more things there in the prevention in the primary services so that the children will not even end up here so above according to her you actually have to spend more on primary and secondary services and reduce your tertiary services it's possible but we are doing the other way around we don't do anything at the primary which is at the society level we don't do much at the risk groups we don't identify them we don't do any interventions we only do something when they end up here as trashnavi is also saying when they come to the hospital then you quick and it's also very slow 6 months it takes what are we talking about then protection then what protection we are talking you have a children act 2001 which talks about all this but we are not focusing on the right thing maybe as social workers and social policy specialists we should talk about the look what are the primary services we have in our child protection system what kind of society that we are building it is not visible you know no prime minister can actually talk you know look you know i have spent to you know 1 ringgit 1 billion ringgits you know on this it's not it's not uh, attractive that's where they they focus here on the tertiary things structures but 
unfortunately that's not good for our uh, child production system though it is required we cannot stop all the children there and here they will end up here but we can reduce the numbers if you focus on primary services we can focus on secondary services we can reduce the numbers here but we do reverse we do, we spend a lot of money here very less money here i don't think we spend any money there in our budgets that's the issue here that's the issue here that's one of the issue let's say that so this is what she says that we should be thinking uh, in terms of uh, looking at our primary services secondary services and tertiary services this is another slide uh, come coming from i think some advisor from unicef this is what she thinks about about the whole child production issue what do you think there is this exploitation happening which our children act also talks about it there is this abuse which our children act is also talks about it there is this neglect there is this violence all these four different domains again you know uh, uh, so the earlier slide talks about from a services point of view the primary services secondary services and tertiary services the service you know this talks about the actual child abuse or ch uh, child exploitation or neglect whatever so a particular child either there or here or here or there already tertiary you know we have come to you know maybe we are almost leading to you know children who are in emergencies children who are crisis children who are displaced children who are under uh, war kind of situations children who are uh, disasters natural disasters like flood you know earthquakes volcanoes you know what happens to children do, do, uh, during that situation tsunami you know what happens a lot of trafficking takes place during that time children are displaced there's a lot of mafia you know they collect all the children give food and sell them it happens that is the time you know the, the the governance is weak the media is focusing something else so you go there set up a place put a cross or something like that some religion stuff you collect all the children in the name of feeding them you take them somewhere and they disappear from there maybe you sell them you i don't know what happens very important but most of the time neglected so that's why that red thing there here juvenile justice i think it's again a lot of things happening children with con who come in conflict with law the juvenile centers detention centers whatever just maybe you can give it to all of us <laughs> so this is another area where our children are at risk where the police is involved there's a lot of uh, things here what do you think about this framework where we should focus and how do we understand child production not from services point of view but this is where a lot of production you know or care uh, are required what kind of care required when a child is been exploited what kind of care is required you know uh, when a, a particular child is been abused or exposed to abuse neglect or children in disasters children in juvenile justice so what kind of well, i am talking about this please spend Where? Yeah. Child labor, sexual exploitation. C S E C. What is that? Armed conflict, early marriage. C S E C. Commercial, sexual, and economic. I don't know. I'll find out. I'll find out. Yeah, I don't know. C S E C. What to do with children? sexually and economically what is see then we'll find out it's not just sexual i think there is an economics there trafficking there is no trafficking here so children sexually and economically we don't know armed conflict like nepal for example it is uh, between the you know maoists and the state and children were using as soldiers as um, as drug peddling and um, uh, informers a lot of uh, i mean that is the kind of uh, situation armed conflict between two parties and children are affected in that so uh, when it comes to uh, see you remember this slide this one these three things see i'm i'm putting now three slides important slides why do we need to take care of children because there are some care needs there are six care needs cognitive care emotional care i'll show you that slide also so there are this care needs they also should be protected protection in the society from the all kind of abuses all kind of exploitation 
and there are also safety needs. There are three different needs that we are talking about, care, safety and protection. We are going a little bit detailed, I think I am sure it will help you when you think of protection. Otherwise it looks very simple but it is not that simple, that is what I am trying to do here. Maybe you are only talking about care when you are talking about protection, it will not help. Only you are talking about you know, safety, it will not help because you are missing the other two important things. Maybe you are only talking about protection, not the care and you know, uh, safety needs of the children. They have different needs. If you focus on all that, then basically then we are moving towards a more protective system. This slide is helping us to understand where we are putting our resources. This slide is trying to help us. So I am trying to bring three different presentations to this presentation actually. This, this is done by three different people. This is done by some advisor, you know, regional advisor. She says that, look, this is the thing and this is how the children are being, you know, uh, exploited. So we have to provide services according to that. So still, according to me, still it's a very tertiary service kind of focused. Anything else you can think of this? Or at least this slide will give you the, you know, the different, uh, uh, you know, ways that, are, that the children, you know, is at risk. Where the risk is high, for example. In all this, a particular child at high risk. Is it during exploitation or during abuse? This is what you will be doing as child protection officers. All the time, you are doing two things, the risk and the resilience. So as an officer, your job is to increase the resilience, decrease the risk. And it's not easy. So tell me, for example, do, where do you think the child is at a high risk? During violence? During exploitation? During abuse or during neglect? You think in neglect there is a low risk, right? They're just neglected. Or we can't really tell. The risk is all the time moving. Maybe the child is at a high risk, you know, during abuse. Maybe, you know, maybe you did something, it's only neglect now. It's, you know, less risk. It's, it's a very difficult concept. I can't explain in this class because it's a little out of this. But as child production system or child welfare services, this is the science behind that. If you are not talking about all this, the numbers will abuse or whatever numbers, it will keep increasing because we are not hitting at the right thing. We are not enhancing the resilience. We are not looking at the risk factors. We are doing something else. So another slide I will show you, I think also will help us to understand. Look, this is, where do you want to locate yourself? If you are a child production worker, you will look at social welfare or look at justice or look at, you know, social norms. Most of the, ch you know, the child is also part of this, the way he is socialized, the norms, the culture, the values and social production systems that are in place. So your child production is a mixture or a function of all these four different things. And you have a legislative policy framework. Look how complex is that? At least to me, it's not easy. Because as a social production specialist, you need to understand what is a justice system. What kind of legal environment here in Malaysia? Maybe it's very different from uh, your uh, Brunei Darai Salaam or you know, uh, another country. So you need to understand what kind of justice system that is in place. What kind of social welfare mechanisms are in place? Is it a residual welfare or is it a state? What kind of welfare, state welfare you know, that you have? What kind of social norms and standards, culture, spirituality, religion that operates here in that particular country or in a particular community where children are more at risk? And what kind of social protection mechanisms that are in place? When you bring all these four things together under a, a larger legislative and policy framework, then you are able to understand a particular child uh, and his or her risk or resiliency, whatever. That's what for us child protection. So when we are talking about child protection, you are talking about laws, you are talking about culture, you are talking about uh, justice system, you are talking about many things. Don't you think now is the right way to look at? Am I protected or not? It depends on many things. As my rights, you know, as a, as a visiting lecturer, what rights do I have? What kind of culture, you know, that I'm working in? What kind of, you know, provisions that I have? You know, what kind of... So if I know all that, I'm more protected. You know, I can ask for my rights. I can, I can fight for my rights. I can deliver my responsibilities and duties properly so that I'm more protected. I think that is what the, you know, the rationale behind this slide. So if you want to be in child protection system or child welfare or whatever you call it, 
these are some of the you know, domains of work that we need to deal with, we need to understand. And this is what the care, uh, I'm going a little bit more. We think we are, we are caring people. Parents think they're really taking care of their children. But do you think they can actually think of all this? Look at that. There are physical care. What do you mean by physical care? Physical care. She was giving one example. Uh, uh, a mother who came from an orphanage. Mm. She's, she, she, she spent all his life in you know, an orphanage. She got married and uh, she, she, she delivered a baby. And uh, her baby is always, you know, uh, uh, having some, some disease, it seems. And some kind of a fever, you know, some kind of diseases. And the social worker, you know, trying to find why this particular child is under, you know, all the time, you know, uh, ill. And the social worker went to, his, uh, to her house, everything looks nice, and she's very, you know, caring very well, she's very concerned, she's not an alcoholic. But every time, if you look at the child, there's always an ill history. What, do you, what, what must be the reason? Can you guess? There's no bonding. Huh? There's no bonding. Why do you think there's no bonding? Because she, she herself is in the orphanage. She never had that bonding. So she will never touch the baby. She's taking care of the baby, but she never, you know, takes the baby, hugs the baby and all that. Because she was never, you know, experienced. Yes, that was the reason one. Reason two? How do you find? No, everything is fine. The house is fine. Our husband is fine. Everything is fine. They have, you know, enough resources. But if you look at the children, child, she's always sick. And then for somehow what happened was, the, the, the social worker looked at the way she is washing the nappies. She don't know how to wash the nappies because in the in a in an orphanage where she grew up, she never got you know a clean dry nappies. Now what she is doing in her uh, house, they have it seems two you know parts. One is to just wash, the other one is to dry. So she is she is using the same water all the time and she is not drying them because she never knew how to wash a nappy properly because she comes from an orphanage background. And that's the cause for the, you know, ch the, 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 the child illness, physical care. So it could be, you know, you have everything, but you don't know how to use it. Even, even medicines, even that milk, whatever, what, you know, how much you should, what is the dosage, what is the right dosage. Emotional care, cuddling. In some uh, Hong Kong, I think there's another uh, presentation, what they're promoting is that touching. In certain uh, uh, communities, they don't allow, you know, they don't like to be touched. I think in Muslim culture also, you're not, you're not supposed to touch the head, it seems. Even ch children, I don't know, there was someone, some people were saying, I just came to know that. You know, it's, it's, it's real, you know, uh, this thing. So that, that in Hong Kong, that particular project is promoting, you know, just touching between, you know, family members, the husband and wife, the wife and the children, the husband and children. Just there are some games where they have to really touch. You know, it makes a difference, you know. So emotional care, psychological care, what is cognitive care? Cognitive development, the brain. Uh, what, what, what do we mean by that? Mm -hmm. The difference between the girl and the boy, you know. If you look at some, uh, I think, uh, children's brain development in Armenia somewhere, it's very shrinking because they are under high pressure, different situation, there is no nutrition, they are abused. So the very brain, you know, the, the, the shape and the, you know, it, you can see that it seems. I have another slide. Social care, moral care, there's so many things. You can add it maybe, you know. The seventh one, the spiritual care, you know, the, res the responsibility of a child, the, the attach that you will, you know, uh, 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 give uh, a, a particular child in a particular community. You are some? Exactly. Because it provides a security for the baby. For the baby. And also the love. So it provides food and love. So it, it creates a very strong... Strong bonding. Yeah. Uh, Children who are fed under the breastfeeding and on the... I think there is a difference. Yeah. You can... You know, there's a lot of research evidence. This is a bonding, you know. So um, emotional care, psychological... So what kind of... Are we giving all this care when our children, when we are talking about care? Do we know all this? There's a lot of science behind this. There's a lot of research is happening. So these are the six or seven basic needs when it comes to the care. 
or protection. So we can, we can go on like this. So once you have that in place, and there are levels of care at the family level, at the community level, and the societal level. Okay, your family is fine, you know, you're able to take care of your children. But when they're in the community, again, you know, for example, uh, there, are, there is this uh, African community here. In, 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 uh, uh, I have another friend, Bola. She brings her son, who is uh, from Nigeria. When he goes to school in Tadika, he has all kind of issues. Whereas my child looks little similar to Malay, whatever. She, she doesn't have any problems. Both of them went to the same school, same time, in the same bus. You know? We leave our children, when they come back, uh, that fellow will tell different stories and my, my, my daughter will tell. And my daughter also initially complained. Uh, other children were saying that you're stinking. Because my daughter did not have the habit of taking bath, bath before going to the school in Nepal because it's very cold. So they just go to the school in the morning without bath or whatever. When they come back from the school at uh, say 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, it's hot. So we give them the bath that time, not before going to the school. So here she, go, she, she, she does that. So the other children complained it seems. Well, you are stinking. So I looked at why they are saying this. Then we found, you know, maybe because of this reason. Then we, start, we explained her, maybe you take the bath and go and maybe you see. And it, it worked out. It worked. They, they, they didn't say that anymore. And then now she's taking bath before that. Care. We think we are giving, you know, care, nice you know, clothes and all that. It will not work until unless you actually go into that. <coughs> So that's what I mean, child protection. So this slide talks about child care needs, its responsiveness. Are we really responsive to children, you know, uh, issues? When they say something, oh, you're just telling like that, maybe you're stinking, maybe the other children are bullying you. You know, I can just, you know, ignore that. But, you know, we said, why are they saying that? Is it bullying or is it something else? You know, then when you look into this, when, oh, you are doing that, maybe here, you know, there's a different system. It, it really worked. So that's what I mean. Risk responsiveness. How, how do you respond? So I will not go into details, but what I'm trying to bring your attention is, when you're talking about children, children's services or child protection, there's a lot of things that are happening. There are a lot of you know, uh, um, uh, models that are available. We need to use them. We need to use them so that you can, uh, you can better respond. OK. This is a macro picture. I think this is the last slide uh, when it comes to theory. What do you think about this? The main features of a national child production system. OK, you are in the ministry, and you are, you are, you are, you are supposed to come up with a, you know, a macro picture. You have to you know, build a child production system for Malaysia. What are the issues that you will take care? You remember the first slide? I'm talking about the family level, the six care needs. Right? The second slide? a little more, you know, at the family level, at the community level, and the society level. Now this slide, I think, should be able to help us. If you are a bureaucrat or a policy maker, and you are responsible for preparing a national production system, what kind of things that you will look into? This, this slide might help us. So again, it's the same thing. The primary prevention, which we talked about, the secondary prevention, the secondary services, and the tertiary services. Maybe the primary prevention, can be provided by the target general population, like awareness raising, universal services, because it's for the whole society. Secondary prevention strategies only focused on the target risk groups, children who are at risk, HIV AIDS, you know, refugees, you know, low income groups or whatever. You know, secondary prevention, which is less. Whereas the tertiary services could be for targeted individuals, the particular child who got risk, the particular child who is got abused, the particular family, you know. So this, this could be one, you know, a pyramid structure. You have a big basic services, the primary services, a small secondary services, and very small tertiary services. But as of now, it's like this. The tertiary services is high, the secondary services is a little bit, and the primary services is very slow. It's the reverse pyramid. But this is the best you know, way to do this. If you are the you know, responsible person, Maybe you can, you can look into this. OK, shall we move? OK, now, maybe uh, in the next one hour or half an hour we have. Now you know what is child protection. What are the laws that are existing? What we mean by care, what we mean by you know, risk, what we mean by resilience, and all that is there. But how do you make sure that you, the system is working? So that is where I think the monitoring, 
and review or evaluation comes into picture. As a planner, as a, as a program manager, I think you cannot escape this. Everything is in place, only that mother is not aware how to use the washing machine. That is the issue. Once the mother is able to, you know, you are able to equip that, she's fine. So how do you monitor then, you know, so that the child abuse cases will come down or the care, you know, the domains of care will improve, you know, the levels of service is much better. How do you monitor? What are the tools that you have? What is monitoring and review? I'm monitoring your growth and someone is monitoring my teaching, my performance here. What is monitoring? Why do we need to monitor? What happens if we don't monitor programs like child protection? We don't be able to evaluate, okay. Evaluate what? Hmm? Yeah, the interventions or the objectives or the goals that we have, we will not be able to achieve. We don't know where we are going. We are, mon we are not monitoring our progress. We are not monitoring our, our own you know, mistakes. We are not monitoring our own you know, whatever levels of you know, uh, results that we want to achieve. But is monitoring is very difficult. Why people talk about this? This is the presentation that I made. You know? Monitoring and review is a very important step in the whole planning process. Maybe one of the last you know, uh, 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 that comes in the cycle of planning. But it also helps us to estimate the progress that has been made or not made. Okay, you planned for uh, 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 very good primary services to be in place, but you don't know what you have done. So you need some monitoring and review capacity so that you should be able to monitor every day. What is the difference between monitoring and uh, what is the what is the difference between monitoring and evaluation? By the way, this is one question asked me. Someone asked me there. What is monitoring and what is evaluation? Monitoring is. Exactly, day one to day end. Whereas evaluation, also in maybe in but certain intervals, you have a, a internal evaluation after three weeks or three months or three years. So evaluation is actually specific. It's not a day-to-day -day FI, but monitoring is a continuous day-to-day -day FI, though it has evaluative features, right? So that's why monitoring is much more important to me than evaluation when it comes to child protection. You have to really monitor every day. Every day, every step. This is it, uh, yeah. Huh? So how do we monitor? What are the tools that we have? Any ideas? What kind of tools you have you want to monitor? I want to monitor your learning. What should I do? I have this. This is part of the monitoring. Your participation is part of monitoring. Your exam is a, a part of the monitoring. Also, in a way, but it's also maybe at the end of the monitoring, you know, that is the last thing that we use, of course, through that we evaluate your performance. What else? What are the tools? What kind of tools? Any idea? Log frameworks? What, what, what kind of tools that people use when it comes to monitoring? Or let's say, when, when it comes to child protection, what kind of monitoring tools that we should have? Put cameras in the every household? Huh? In, in Tesco, you know, everywhere you have monitored, you know, they have uh, monitoring cameras. You can, you, can, you can set targets to achieve, like, uh, for example, by the end of this year, the child protection will be achieved by this year. Okay, you set up some indicators, okay. By end of 2015, we will reduce, okay, child abuse cases. Okay, we have some indicators. What else? What other than that? Now, let's say family. How do we monitor a particular family, whether it is safe, whether anyone is not abused or abused, what kind of risk they're facing, what kind of resilience they have, what kind of, how do we monitor families? Hmm? Child protection is all about there, right? Family, community, society, right? So how do we monitor at these three levels? Maybe as a case manager, you're only you know, responsible for family. But I'm talking about the, this slide. You are, you are advisor to the prime minister or you are the director general. You know, you have to monitor the whole child protection system in Malaysia, all 13 states. How do you monitor? So monitor also at different levels, right? So I'm talking about that. Maybe you are just a case manager in an NGO. So you just monitor your own cases, 25, 30 cases. Your social welfare officer, JKM, 
you are monitoring in your uh, department or in your job area, whatever. Maybe just uh, 10 compound, I mean, I don't know what is. Maybe I think they have, how many social welfare offices we, we usually have in a district? You don't know, we have to find out. I think they, they're, they're, they cover about 30,000 population. For 30,000 population, there's one welfare officer, something like that. There is a calculation. So you're responsible for 30,000 population means it's about one officer, something like that. Altogether, we have in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh-huh, 350. Mm -hmm. For 30%, 35% only. 35% what? Okay, we'll find out more. I think you're responsible for about uh, 25,000 population or something like that. We'll find out. I mean, I'm not very sure. But basically, your monitoring is a part of your duty. You will be monitoring. Maybe the levels are different. So we need different indicators or different tools according to your job, right? So monitoring and review is a crucial step. It, is, it helps us to assess the impact or the effectiveness of the programs that we implement. Otherwise, we don't know. It also helps us to exchange the best practices because when you're monitoring, you will be able to capture those things that are working or not working so that we can actually create a model and share with others. Look, this is what I have done in, in, in this compound, and this is working. All children are actually now you know, safe, for example. It is also to help you to understand the importance of participatory monitoring tools. Now there is a little bit more about traditional monitoring tools and participatory monitoring tools. There's so many tools that are available now. It actually makes your job easier compared to you know, in the past. So maybe it also helps you to understand the tools and mechanisms or computer-based you know, uh, tools that are available now. It also helps you to understand that, how others are monitoring and how you are monitoring, uh, so that what is the difference, you know, what is most effective. Also develop to monitor a section in your own organizational action plan, because it's very important. When we are talking about child protection, we cannot forget about monitoring. I think it plays a very important you know, uh, aspect of the whole production system. As I said, monitoring has multiple objectives. If you are a uh, director general, the way you monitor the whole you know, child production system in Malaysia, maybe it's a different purpose than you as a case manager in a particular NGO. So, People use monitoring and review or review capacity or review tools to measure the impact, to measure the outputs, to measure the efficiency, to measure the effectiveness or to measure the change. Or in some people might use monitoring to strengthen the accountability, for example. Can you give us an example? For example, this one, you know, it's recorded, you know, now I know, you know, uh, whatever I'm saying, how, how I'm dealing the class, how I, the, it's, I'm more accountable, you know, with just uh, a recording tool here, you know. Maybe there are other accounting, you know, like, like the swipe card. It's an accountability mechanism, for example. You know, I've been monitored through at what time I come, at what time I leave, you know. So it could be you know, also to strengthen accountability. Monitoring system is also to facilitate organizational learning because you are monitoring every day, you know, you can actually compile what you have achieved so you can uh, you can learn new things you can rectify you can make you know midterm you know corrections to strengthen partnerships and team building to support advocacy efforts to influence an organization culture there's so many advantages when you monitor when you actually monitoring is all about what collecting data you monitor you, you look at certain processes you know you have evidence you observe you write you document Right? All this comes in monitoring. When it happens, basically, you know, you can see this uh, 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 cycle here. When you monitor a uh, capacity system in place, make more informed decisions because you have a lot of data now on which you can make a better decisions. Learn from experiences and you will be more accountable. So all, when all these three things are happening, actually you as a child production officer or a manager or a whatever, you build your own capacities and you build the capacities of the colleagues, you build the capacity of the organizations that are involved. Basically, we build the capacity of the, our child protection system.
That's why monitoring plays an important role. But most often it is neglected. We just do something and we don't really use the data. Uh, there is a process monitoring and there's an impact monitoring. There are types of monitoring. When, you, when I say a process monitoring, you just routinely write some dairy, you just write some reports and give it to your boss. You know, you write, you know, general things. There's something called impact monitoring, you know, how much case, how many cases you delivered, how many cases you attended, how many cases you, you actually solved, you know, the impact of your work. So most of the time we focus on the impact monitoring, not on the process monitoring. You don't worry what you have written. You only worry about how many cases you actually, you know, handled in that particular month. So when I only focus on impacts, I think I'm losing a lot of things there. So monitoring in that way has a lot of purposes, a lot of objectives. It also depends what kind of work, where you are placed. Again, we need to monitor, we, ha we have to enhance our monitoring capacity because child production is politically sensitive. There's a lot of stigma attached. It's very sensitive. It's very, it, most of the time it is hidden, especially abuse, exploitation, you know, violence. So it's very difficult even to get monitor. It's not easy. Huh? So that seek to work political sensitive, ethical in nature and underreported. Whereas your monitoring is all about reporting, all about data. Then how do you manage this? How do you really monitor then? Because you're the way, the, the, the issue that you're looking is very undercover. Can you monitor corruption? Of course, there are ways to monitor corruption. But is that easy? No. It is, most of the time it is, you know, they, 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 they have other ways to, you know, get scot free. Child production is like that. To me, child production in the literature, you do, it's a wicked problem. Wickedness, wicked, W-I-C-K-E-D. What is the wickedness? It's very evil nature. You know, it's very easy, it's very complex. But wicked problems are the uh, problems, like poverty is a wicked issue, it's a complex issue. You know, one measure will not help. One monitoring, you know, a tool will not uh, capture the whole story. So for child production, monitoring is not easy. But without monitoring, you can't improve. It's that kind of, you know, issue. So we need to be really careful. A lot of tools now. And at the same time, it's not impossible. You see? All problems have solutions. Even wicked problems have solutions. You know? The only thing is, your commitment, your passion, your accountability, your skill matters. When it comes to monitoring, there are a lot of you know, tools that are available now. In the last 50 years, 60 years, a lot of tools that are available. You can see but there is participatory monitoring tools, there are participatory impact monitoring. Look at that. This is from Nepal. What are they doing? They are monitoring the weight of the children. What they have? They have nothing. They have just one uh, weighing machine and then one uh, you know, it's very appropriate, very community owned, and you can actually monitor the children's, uh, you know, health. That's what's happening in Nepal. When you go to Nepal, you can see this. It's a very famous example in monitoring nutrition and uh, uh, monitoring uh, about the children's health done by community people. It's called participatory monitoring. Participatory community, you know, monitoring. You can see that. I also maybe explain a little bit. So it's very easy. What is the big thing? And they will write on a chart and then they, 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 they assess the, 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 the height and the weight of the child. If a particular child is dropping down, then they'll find why it is happening and they go to the family and then they, they find out. Maybe, you know, the mother is sick or the father is gone and they'll try to, you know, give uh, some, some inputs there. So very simple, very easy, very effective. Here also, right? Uh, but it's community won. Well, the, the two nurses will come, they do all that. But a particular child losing weight, immediately the action is taken? Uh -huh. If that is their responsiveness, fine. Huh? They don't make a home visit. Yeah. The best is if you can monitor your own programs by the community who are the beneficiaries, that's the best. That's why now we are talking about uh, the community-based monitoring tools and all that. Uh, so there are a lot of you know, tools that are available. But selecting the right monitoring tools is the, you know, the, the, the crux of the, you know, the, the, the issue, the, the success. 
you know what are the what is that you are monitoring why is that you are monitoring what tool will give you the you know the best results and that's where i think your skill has to come in because some monitoring tools are complementary some monitoring tools are you know uh, um, has a broad applicability they will not be able to find out the exact you know uh, the the results some monitoring tools are substitutes you know for example you are doing a, a, a household survey and you are doing something else so it substitutes your the main survey you know so there are these issues that you also have to be very careful and aware of so what tools that you are using and why okay so selecting the right monitoring tool also is very important for example this is one monitoring tool called smart this is a computer based tool you know systematic monitoring and review technique departments like you know jkm they might use this because they have to collect information from 13 states and in each state uh, maybe there are so many districts you know so how do you monitor then how do you put the bar graphs and all that it's a, it's a, it's based on key performance indicators you already you know uh, uh, decided in the beginning and you monitor against these indicators and you use computers you know uh, to collect this uh, to collect and analyze this data for example so it's called systematic monitoring and review technique which you any 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 organization can have even even uh, uh, tesco must be having you know, they must be monitoring their you know consumer behavior and all that who is buying what so that's why sometimes they give uh, this dutch lady you know milk you know in four ringgits sometimes they don't give they don't have that you know so uh, create a culture of complaints aimed at improving financial stability complaints and quality you know when you are monitoring in hospitals for example how much is being spent who is paying you know what fees you know whether fees are paid in time or not so how do you how do they manage they use this computer based each department will punch in at the end you can actually you know put together and and see you know whether whether the bills are paid in time uh, how many people are actually getting relieved how much is the salary you know all that you can you can actually uh, do this if you look at thailand this is another presentation that i have taken them they are using some 23 or 22 locally identified household specific indicators to monitor and this is done by a, 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 a university a mahidol university it's a project of a mahidol university like usm we can also do that for malaysia for example uh, and they have come up with 22 locally identified tested relevant for example uh, how many times you hug a child can we ask that question in malaysia or not but you can ask this question maybe in australia you know so that is what i mean you know monitoring you know and the monitoring indicators so the cpms is based on a set of 22 locally identified child and household specific indicators that may reflect how well a child is being protected from neglect violence and exploitation for example in malaysia we ask how many times you hug a child uh, in a day once twice never for example many families you know tick never what you will do or you may you might not even ask this question in 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 a context of malaysia for example then you lose a very important data so the indicators that you use play an important role you have beautiful monitoring system but you ask irrelevant questions then it's then then the whole exercise is a waste so this is the mahidol university they ask very interesting questions you can see that child specific indicators number of children without thai nationality very important you know Num uh, number of children without certification low risk high risk you can see that you know you go on to this website and see that uh, number of uh, children with deceased parents number of children who are under the you know uh, uncle or you know under the caregivers under the foster families or you know all that you can collect and see at what stage your children are you know whether under high risk or low risk or whatever so this is monitoring a child protection monitoring system cpms i think they have also added more things here so institute of nutrition mahidol university came up very interesting this is what they presented there so i have not seen such thing uh, for a malaysian presentation for example so they have 23 locally tested household child specific indicators which we may also can use it so there is something called critical path analysis i will not spend more time on this but there are certain uh, business people or you know uh, managers they they use this to make decisions when you are monitoring your uh, performance of your uh, staff or your subordinates how much time they take on decisions for example 
critical path analysis you can see here for example uh, uh, you want to uh, uh, what is that you want to achieve in week 1 week 2 week 3 for example you're you're you're, you're organizing a, a polio campaign or polio house to house you know service so whether it is achieved or not how much time it will take to achieve you know to cover all the households in a particular state for example so that is what you know once you once you don't uh, each activity is related to the other activity for example you don't have uh, polio bags or polio you know that uh, what do you call the, those capsules you can't even think of in you know, a household visits once you have that transportation you know to the to the clinic from the clinic the, the nurse will go into the house how much time it will take for example four days will that survive for four days the 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 the, 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 the drops or you know so all that is all part of your monitoring so this this kind of uh, tools will help you uh, there's something called program evaluation and review technique also it's a little variation of the the critical path analysis for example it gives you you know for example for a vaccination the shortest time is one day okay shortest time one day plus four this is the equation that they came up with multiplied with likely time maybe one and a half day plus longest time maybe three days divided by six is actually the exact so in this case shortest time one day plus four multiplied by likely time 1.5 plus can can someone do this shortest time one day one plus four multiplied by likely time likely time is like you can actually go to a house and finish it in one and a half day 1.5 plus longest time it will take maybe there is a strike you didn't have the petrol for your whatever the the household is not there by the time you came so maximum say three days plus three uh, divided by six how much it is one plus 4, 5, likely time 1.5, 6.5, plus 3, 9.5. 9.5 by 6 is what? 1.3 or something like that, right? That is the actual time that you need to vaccinate one particular family. So this is a kind of a calculation. So these, these tools are there. You know, the only thing is we need to know them and use them. So when you plan your thing, you put 1.3 uh, as a minimum thing, not just one day. So that you know you can you can uh, 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 you can cover all the delays and all that. This is an UNDP uh, monitoring handbook. It's also available. You know they are talking about results-based monitoring. What do we mean by that? Earlier they were talking about something. Now they are talking about results-based monitoring. What do we mean by that? When you say results-based monitoring, you are talking about outcome monitoring, not output. There's a difference between output and outcome, right? So earlier they were only focusing on inputs and outputs. But when you're talking about results, now they're talking about outcome. Outcome is not numbers. It's the actual work that you have achieved. For example, you have uh, uh, 100 families are vaccinated. You have given some input. 100 families are uh, uh, safe and vaccinated. What is the outcome? Okay. Healthy uh, families or you know, there is a change in the attitudes, this and that. Earlier, they were only, you know, when they're monitoring, they were only looking at 100 and 100 or 90, 80. But now they're looking at the results. Okay, now that 100 families are vaccinated, the, 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 you know, the, the health insurance is less. The hospitals are, you know, less burdened. You know, the whole community is now, now, now that they have, they have learned from this mother, another 100 families have learned, you know, the, output, uh, the, uh, the outcome. So your monitoring now should focus on not just inputs and outputs, but the outcome, which they, we were not doing earlier. Very simple, but it makes a lot of difference to the monitoring. So this is another literature, set of literature which is taught. So when it comes to child protection, what is that we should focus on? Remember, we, all this we are doing under child protection. For under child protection, what kind of monitoring system we should have? What we mean by results-based monitoring? How many children are under care? How many children are uh, given counseling? How many children received? Uh, is that or something else? Results-based monitoring. Maybe how many children are more resilient now? And that resilience, you know, comes from where? How, could, could our system built 
you know, enhance the children's resilience or not. So it's something, are our children are more healthy or not? Are our children are more confident? Whether children feel safe and secure in a particular, you know, community or not? The outcomes. So when you're focusing on outcomes, your monitoring indicators will be different. No more just numbers, it's more than that. So this is another uh, uh, framework that now UNDP organizations like UNDP are promoting. So for us, for child production is again important. We can learn a lot of things from here and focus on outcomes. That means less children are abused, less children are under risk, less, more families uh, are protected or you know, uh, responsive. You can see that. Earlier we were uh, focusing on implementation monitoring. Now we are focusing on outcome monitoring. I don't go in detail. You can read in your own time. It's very easy, self-explanatory. Self so my point here is that at child production specialists, what kind of monitoring tools that we use? We use that or we can also, you know, uh, uh, shift a little bit and also, you know, focus on, on uh, 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 um, issues like this. Yeah, for example, there's something else you will come uh, in the monitoring letter, right-based monitoring. People started saying this. Child production is all about rights, again, you know. So when you're saying right-based monitoring, you're looking at not numbers, not inputs, not outputs. You're looking at the change that has come, change that has been achieved in terms of rights. Look at that. Changes in policies, whether it has come or not. Changes in children's and young people's participation, decision making. How many children participated? How many children, you know, wrote signatures? How many children, you know, sent letters? How many children participated in family day, you know, decisions? How many children? Or what are the changes in the capacity of the communities and civil society to support and demand for children's rights? The changes. Changes in equity and non-discrimination of children, the girl and boy, or Malay and Chinese, or Indian, whatever. All these factors brings changes in lives of children. And that's what rights-based monitoring. So it's up to you what kind of monitoring that you will use. Rights-based, outcome-based, or you know, community-based. Look at that. There are huge. You can become a monitoring evaluation specialist for UNICEF. There are a lot of jobs. You just type monitoring evaluation specialist, you will be surprised. And it's it's, it's a very interesting job because you collect all the information, put in different things, and then you advise your, your, your other colleagues. Look, this is what it looks like. So it's a very special job, very interesting job. There is a child production emergencies group. There are a lot of things again, you know. You just go through the slides, you will come to know. And now, this is 2012 slide. The UNICEF now is talking about measuring and monitoring child production systems. What, is the, what are they saying? They want to measure and monitor the child production monitoring systems, like you know, 10 countries in the region. So if you want to really work with UNICEF in this area, you should know this. This is what they will ask you in the interview. Okay, what are the care, you know, what are the, you know, then they will also ask you this. Definitely, if you really aspire, work with international NGOs, you should know this. This report is again available on the, on the uh, internet, just type this. So what they're saying here is, now they're moving from issues to governance systems, what they call systems approach. They're not looking at issues like child abuse, you know, uh, child exploitation, child trafficking. These are all issues at earlier they were focusing. Now they're focusing on a systems-based approach. Why child trafficking at all? Why child exploitation at all? Why, you know, uh, uh, neglect at all in a community? Is it because of the policies, the governance? something like rights, you know. They're not focusing on individual issues, but they're, issue, they're focusing on a particular system. For example, the, the light is not working, why? Is it the bulb is not working, the electricity is not enough, or it is already the heat capacity? They're not looking at that. They're looking at the, the whole, you know, uh, 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 the, the thing as a whole. Earlier, they were only focusing on the nature of the bulb, the quality of the bulb, the quality of the light, you know, the connection. But now, they're looking at the whole thing. A particular child is violated or trafficked or neglected because maybe, you know, the Children Act is not very, you know, talking about that. Or the particular families are not aware. I will not be able to explain in detail. So basically, this is what they're, they're talking about here. 
there are more tools, I'll stop here. You can… you can see all kind of things. So, it's up to you what you want to learn and what kind of tools that you use. So, any questions please? I can show you, you know, for example, what are the differences between traditional monitoring and participatory monitoring. Bangladesh using two indicators, for example, when it comes to child part protection, they're using just two indicators, the birth registration and the child labor statistics. Each… every child is registered, that itself is, you know, an indicator for a… for a, you know, a, a safe uh, uh, system, for example. They're just using two indicators. Again, Bangladesh, uh, you, this report is again available on the… on the… On the, on the for example, in Afghanistan, they're using children to monitor the programs. They're called child well-being committees. Children groups, like 7 to 13 years, they maps, okay, in our community, this area is very risk-prone. You know, here there are a lot of, you know, drug users. When they, we go there, they'll, they'll hit us. Or this, this valley is not protected, we, we may fall down. This school is dilapidated. You know, they, they, they drew the maps and they find out where all the risks in that particular community from a children point of view. And the, 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 the NGO takes it up and make them, you know, it's called child well-being committees. So using children, uh, uh, monitoring the program, you know, by the children is a very successful story in Afghanistan, for example. So all in Nepal, for example, as I said, uh, Nepal I have shown you. They were looking at uh, malnutrition issue. How many children are malnutrition in Nepal and why? For example, they wanted to find out, so they just used these maps, small, you know, uh, um, uh, graph that is monitored by the, you know, community worker in the village. So she will dot, you know, for each child there is one, one card. So every uh, Friday or Sunday, uh, they, they will take the weight and she will, you know, measure those dots. The moment the line is coming down, the negative growth pattern, then she will immediately go to that family. Why? What is happening? Is the mother is under stress, mother is not taking enough food, she has to work or father is not there or something else. You know, they will find out and then they will try to help the family. Very simple indicator, chart, tool, done by community level, in the community, by the community. This is one technique. There is… Uh, That, that's written in Nepali, of course. The first one is about amako dud garne, whether the mother is able to give the milk or not. You know. Uh, second one is what kind of nutrition that the mother should supposed to be taking. Yeah, taking. You know. So that is what uh, uh, explained here. And basically, this, these dots will tell you, you know, whether the child is, you know, whether growing properly or not. It should be within that range. See, that range is there. Within that range, if that is within the range, then they don't do anything. Otherwise, they will do some intervention. They'll go to the family, they'll find out. So, yeah, there are some common traps, as I said. When you are a monitoring specialist or a monitoring, you might end up with how many advertisements, how many posters, how many activities, how many trainings, how many workshops, but not actually what is achieved, what is the outcome. This is output, the numbers, but you don't. You know, whether you are monitoring or measures of reach, satisfaction, engagement, quality of the programs, if you don't capture that, then you're again, you know, um, so how to avoid this trap? By asking right questions. How do you ask right questions? For example, this. This is one way to ask right questions. This is called most significant change technique. Very simple. It's not, it looks very big, but it's very simple. How do you do this? For example, you go to your community, ask the, ask the people there, your beneficiaries or your, your target group, the same question over a period of time. So, okay, I'll ask you, is this class good? Okay, well, any, any, this one, second week, third week, fourth week, then I collect all these responses and analyze, then I'll come to know what is this. For example, uh, this is also part of this, like they, they, they look at the stories which people tell and get, uh, you know, information out of that. They also look at, uh, show pictures and ask, you know, uh, raise, uh, you know, community's uh, discussion on this, basically, also as a monitoring tool. Pocket charts, you read this, you will come to know. There are these, you know, charts in, in a small pockets. The mothers can pick it up, read the chart and keep it back and they can assess their own situation and then tell uh, where she falls in, in that, in that, in that categories, for example. So this, this most significant change question, as I said, 
you ask uh, people the same question over a period of time. How do you will ask? Looking back over the last few weeks or months, in your opinion or point of view, what do you think was the most significant change that took place in this community when it comes to child production? You ask the same question to I don't know how many people, but the same people, you know, uh, uh, again, you know, over a period of time, and then you analyze, and you have some follow-up questions, then you will come to know what's happening in that community. It's a very simple monitoring technique, which is called most significant change. It's been promoted by the World Bank, for example. Uh, it's also freely available. You read this. It's very simple, very simple. This is also as a research methods. Now it has been promoted by the SAIS and others. It's like participatory monitoring tool. And social workers especially can use this because it will not require a lot of, a lot of money. Okay, I'll stop here. So I'll, I have some more examples how India is doing and all that. But uh, maybe I'll just slow you slides. So in, in Nepal, because there was a war, there's a different review and monitoring technique, a UN high level, you know, uh, 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 monitoring and review technique where they use different indicators like impartiality of the information collectors, confidentiality of the individual, security issues. They have a different monitoring, you know, indicators, that level, you know, that's the idea of this. So what I suggest is that we as a child production, you know, uh, workers, we, we can use mix, uh, mixture of methods and there are advantages of using these methods. And for example, in a country like India, where you have uh, 440 million children, you know, how many times bigger than Malaysia, you know? So how do you monitor, for example? There's so many issues they have. There's a lot of mechanism issues, child and child protection. You know, they, they, now they have something called Integrated Child Protection System, ICPS, you know? Then this is a, a, a district level network. This is a, a state level, you know, system network. This is a national level. They're a little complicated. And now there are very uh, weak accountability, monitoring, and evaluation mechanisms. So now what India is doing is a web-enabled child production management information system, which is called MIS, Management of Information System. Now, now the technologies are available. From each village, the, the, the data is punched in. It goes to the district level, state level, and national level. There is a huge... Uh, uh, institute which is working behind. They also have a website for to track missing children. Each country is developing the systems because they want to invest in their children. They want to have secure, you know, uh, future for their children because they are the precious resource. There is no other way. So the ultimate goal is to develop a comprehensive. Your monitoring system should be comprehensive. It should be integrated, appropriate, sensitive to the cultures, religion, database that you can use and monitor. Children in care, children in need of care. And there are a lot of you know, these risk groups. So you have to bring data from all these different groups and then come up with an integrated monitoring system which will uh, enhance your child protection. So what is the incremental approach to monitoring? You expand in space. You are only doing one state. You do it two states. You are doing all 13 states. You expand in terms of time. Earlier, you were only taking data for one month. Now you take every 15 days, maybe later every week, maybe later every day. So expand the time horizon or you take the data for five years, analyze and come up with system. Expansion in terms of scope, earlier you were only monitoring maybe communities or families, or only in rural areas. Now you monitor or expand your scope. You include all risk groups, including the refugee children, asyliming children, or children from the low, fa low income family, you expand the scope of your, your system and you expand your methods that you're using. Earlier you were only using surveys. Now you're using more you know, community-based, community-owned um, uh, methods. So why do we need to do all this? At the end, we have to sustain the system. The, the bureaucrats or the child worker, production workers should be interested in, families should be you know, interested in this. We are not doing this just to you know, find faults with them, to provide adequate resources so that you, know, you, you, you will be able to do it. Making monitoring a routine part of the workload. It's not something extra. You just do it as part of the job because you know the very value of monitoring when it comes to child production. So that is what uh, I thought will be interesting for today, where we are talking about, what are we talking about? Social policy and welfare services for children and young people. Young people I didn't talk about much, but we can talk about more or less the same. Uh, any questions? We're almost done. 
So today, what is that we discussed? Initially, we discussed the, the, the acts and policies that are relevant to the Malaysia, especially the Children Act 2001, which is very comprehensive. Then we discussed a little bit about the care, the levels of care, the domains, and the child production issues. And at the end, I have shown you how do you monitor this to ensure that child production mechanisms are in place and some examples and some, some tools and some ideas from the World Bank, UNDP, and all that. I think there are three components. I will not ask much questions on this, but basically the important question here is, what is a child production system? And how you can, uh, what, do you, what do you think about child production system in Malaysia? And give some critical feedback. So just read a little bit and think, how the child production system look like? Why the you know, number of children uh, are abused or uh, exploited, you know, why is this uh, increasing? Why a mother is becoming a perpetuator? Why, you know, the caretaker, you know, abusing the uh, children? Is it, is it our attitudes? Is it our culture? Is it legal lapses? What is that? If you ask this critical question, I think you're already there. So thank you very much. Any questions?